On this edition of Around BCC, BCC continues to reduce its carbon footprint. It's a month of honoring student success. And we talked to a member of the BCC faculty who encourages students to give back to the community. Welcome to Around BCC. I'm Keith Tebow. We're in the final stretches of the 2012-2013 academic year here at Bristol Community College as students are gearing up for their final exams with uh, classes ending at the end of the month and graduation in early June. With being spring, our thoughts turn to warmer weather and also going outside and enjoying our natural resources. Well, Bristol Community College has long been in the business of trying to make sure that we use our resources here more effectively and more efficiency, efficiently rather, through sustainability efforts and being more green. We're going to talk about that now for the first part of our program. I'm joined by Steve Kenyon. He is the Vice President of Administration here at Bristol Community College and also a key player in our sustainability efforts here at the college. Steve, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Oh, my it. pleasure. Thanks for having me, Keith. You know, for a long time, BCC has always been into making itself more efficient um, for one of the main reasons, for e economic purposes. It just makes True. sense to, to try to be more efficient in many areas. But in terms of how we use the natural resources and how BCC uh, is efficient in that realm, what's been the background on how BCC has evolved over the years? Yeah, I, I mean, it goes back to probably 2007 when the, the president became a charter, President Sprague became a charter member of the uh, Climate Action Plan. It's a group of uh, colleges around the country that saw this as the, the vision of higher education or a major component of it. So the college, under Jack's leadership, adopted that. And that prompted us in 2007 to do a, a carbon, to figure out what the college's carbon footprint was. So mm -hmm. we did a greenhouse gas uh, emissions study. And when we got the results, you know, we realized that 72% of that was from our commuters being a commuter campus, right. and the other 28% being from the, the college through our consumption of water, uh, electric, gas, and you know, using paper. And we do consume quite a, quite a bit of, of all of those, uh, electric and gas in particular. So. You know, we decided that we needed to do a carbon, um, I'm sorry, a climate action plan to try to mitigate our carbon footprint. So we set a, a lofty goal of being carbon neutral by 2050, which obviously is a... Still a long ways away. It's still a long ways away, but you know, we believe that, you know, we can achieve that. So what we set out to do was a whole variety of tasks, and the college has a sustainability committee, you know, which is currently chaired by Liz mm -hmm. Wiley, and we thought we'd break that up, you know, between the, the academic side of the house in offering um, curriculum-based sustainable classes. As you probably know, we have a, right. a beekeeping. Right. We have uh, the seeds of sustainability. Uh, we do some gardening, right. some gardening co courses. I know there's a master gardener class being taught now, but my role has been more on the economics, to your original point, in the um, you know the facility side of the house. Hmm. Let me just ask yeah, you, yeah, please. In terms yeah. of in terms of that that study that was done in 2007, that inventory, if you will, where 28 percent is actually of, of our of our carbon footprint can actually be controlled, if you will, mm -hmm. by by the college. That's accurate. Um, how how is that compared to other institutions? Was that was it looked at? Are we in line with other? Were we actually doing a, a pretty good job at that we, point? Yes, we are. Uh, we were back in 2007. I mean, to answer your question, it was on par with other institutions of our size, you know, in, in scope in terms of number of students. It, we I would say we were probably a little bit better than average and that just goes to the uh, I think that it's, it's sustainability has always been on people's minds it's just it's more formalized in the last three four five years at, at the campus and the, you know as a result you know we've done a number of projects to to help improve our 28 percent mm. Let's talk about some of those, sure, um, actually. Sure. You know, it, it's funny. So, some of the things have happened gradually, and, it, it, you know, that was 2007. We're in 2013, so it's already been six years. 
And right. it, it's little things that as a, a person, a staff member who works here, you see every now and then it's like, oh, that's new, and that's new. But you really don't sometimes tie it into the goal of sustainability. One of the things that I notice is just water consumption. Right. The restrooms have, uh, the, the water flow has been, has been altered. Yes. When did that take place? And I guess give us some numbers on how much water we're saving. Yeah, we've actually, since uh, 2009, we did several ECMs, energy conservation member, um, energy conservation measures, I'm sorry, and water was one that we really tackled. And we've cut our water usage by 40%, and most of that was done through uh, low flush toilets. The, you probably noticed when you wash your hands, there's a little less water coming out than there, than there used to be. And also the, the runoff, most of our runoff from our parking lots goes into the pond and into the Watupper. It doesn't go into the city's uh, sewer overflow mm -hmm. project, which you know is helpful for the city not to have to process all that excess water. But we've really done as much as we can you know, to reduce our consumption of water in, in the kitchens, everywhere, restrooms in particular. Mm. Now that, that, that had to be a, a big effort because it was. it's just, li I mean, it's little things where it's just it attachment to, to the faucets, and, uh, but it makes a big difference. I don't notice a difference maybe because we've dealt with it for so long now. Right. I don't feel much of a difference in the water flow, but it does make a difference in terms of the water consumption. Yeah. Now what about um, something in, to, to, to piggyback into water, um, as, as you know and as many people know, at many institutions, not just higher educational institutions is vending machines and they sell water and water bottles and I know that's one of the things where the college is trying to get people to uh, maybe not buy as much water but use what's called these new filling stations where people can refill their own bottles of water throughout campus. Right. Where are those filling stations and are they in every building here? They're, in they're not in every building yet. We're working to that end. There are three. We call them hydration stations right. and I believe they're in G, D, and I'm not sure where the third one is, Keith. I don't right. recall. I thought I saw one in, in, in E. Is that possible? Yes, it is, you're right. It is E. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's in E. But those, and we plan on having them in every building. And, you know, things like that, encouraging people to fill up their own reusable mug or, or water bottle, that in the, our food service selling uh, coffee mugs mm -hmm. so people won't you know, get a new cup of coffee or a new cup every day, you know, which adds to the landfill and, you know, if they reuse their mug, uh, they get a discount. I mean, it's all, it's like you said, it's all those small things that, that really add up, uh, you know, and you may not have noticed the water, but when you start multiplying everything by 10 buildings and, mm. you know, 12 hour days, it, it does, it does add up. Mm. It's like the lights, just the general hallway light fixtures. That was another energy conservation right. measure we did in 2009. We replaced 6,500 lighting fixtures. That, it starts to add up. I mean, it's, it, and it saved a considerable amount of electricity, upwards of about 20% well, for our electric bill just by replacing those fixtures. Now, yeah. let's talk more about, about electricity. Sure. Um, sure. Uh, I, I think we did a story a few years ago on <coughs> their solar panels on the roof of B building. That I was the first installation. First, yeah, right, that was the first installation. Tell us how that came about and how that's going to be growing here in terms of solar energy. Yeah, in 2008, we put up a, a 10 kW uh, photovoltaic uh, panel system on B building. That's enough to probably provide the electricity for one uh, two-story home for a year. Mm -hmm. So it's not significant by college standards, but for you know a homeowner, it would pretty much do the trick for the mm -hmm. whole year. So that was in 2008, and we did that more as an academic uh, showcase, so Professor Robert Rack or others could use that to take their classes up mm -hmm. and look at the installation, look at the inverters, see how the power goes from the panels into the college. And that was just the start in 2008. In 2009, we've since added almost another 100 kW uh, kilowatt hours of photovoltaic. So right now, the roofs of F building, D building, in C building, the entire roofs are covered with photovoltaic panels. And we've, since that installation, have generated hundreds of thousands of kilowatt hours of electricity. How much has it saved the college? 
uh, tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, we were very fortunate that the installation for those were funded by a grant, mm -hmm. so the payback was almost instantaneous for us. You know, if we had purchased them, the return would have probably been seven or eight years, but we were fortunate to get a, to get a grant to mm -hmm. pay for those, so that was very nice. Another um, story which um, has been uh, publicized locally and um, also on this program is the future installation of a wind turbine, which yes. will also help BCC's uh, electrical needs, which will be built right out outside the pond, just, on the other side just of the pond. North, just north uh, east of the pond. And yeah. what's the status of that? I know the, the, um, the college received some, some state money uh, we, this past year it was, to help. It was actually from the Department of Energy Resources. Right. It was a $600,000 grant towards a $3 million project. So that's a 900 uh, kilowatt <laughs> turbine, and we chose that size so it would meet the acoustical requirements that the state had provided so we wouldn't have any issues with our neighbors. And we're hoping to see that go up within the year. Uh, a, a contractor has been selected by the state and we're hoping to see some activity pretty soon out there mm -hmm. and that'll provide about 24 to 26 percent of the college's electricity well, just it's the turbine alone just the wind turbine alone and, and then that, there's also talk of some more solar energy um, acquisition if you will oh, in the future is, yeah there is that's a, a huge project and um, that's called a power purchase agreement and where you know the college committed so much of its resources towards the turbine, which would be funded partially by a grant, but the rest of it through a, a bond uh, financing with the state. But this power purchase agreement is going to allow the college to install two and a half megawatts of photovoltaic panels on the south lots, lot six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And it's a carport canopy system. Uh, students and staff will be able to park underneath the, the carport system free of rain and snow. Mm. And that's going to provide about 70% of the electrical uh, demand that the college uses. So between that project and the turbine, we're going to be flirting with 100% of our power being produced right here on campus, which is just, I think, fantastic. And puts us way out ahead of, of most, uh, most institutions. Now, and how large are these carports going to be? Um, it's going to cover probably about four acres. It's significant. Right. And you know the, the significance of a power purchase agreement is that Sun Edison is, is the company that we have a contract with. They provide all the capital. So the college purchases the electric provided by the panels from Sun Edison. And we purchase that electric at 10 to 15 percent less than we're paying now through National Grid. So going back to your original point, it's a great project for the college economically, but also sustainably. sustainably. So I, that's probably a 20, late 2014 we'll, we'll see those panels out on campus, and I'm just very excited about that. Now one of the things that is important to note, it's sort of like the old business adage, um, to make money, you have to spend money. Yes. Uh, I'm sure the college has thought long and hard and some of these initiatives just because, boy, it may cost us X up front, but you also have to look at what the benefit will be down the line. Has that been some, some difficult decisions? I mean, that, that, that's your role. Your, your it is. It's extremely difficult because, you know, going back to that project in 2009, those energy conservation measures, you know, the contractor that we worked with presented us with about 25 energy conservation measures. And I looked at anything over nine year payback, I just eliminated from the list. Right. So we ended up doing less than half of what they presented, but like the lighting, the 6,500 lighting fixtures, payback between two and three years, easy, right? right. Easy one. You know, they, they funded the panels through a grant. That mm -hmm. was obviously an, an easy choice. You know, the low flush toilets and the, you know, the, the faucets, replacing the faucets and, some of the plumbing fixtures, those are eight or nine years, so we did some of those, but we didn't do them all. Now, it, it's always a balancing act. Like the turbine, I mean, it's a, over $200,000 a year bond payment, but with the payback of seven or eight years, depending on the wind, it's, I, it's, I think it's well worth it. Right. Had it been 20 years, it would have been a tougher <laughs> sell, <laughs> economically. Right. You know, right. environmentally, we, it's an easy sell. I think most folks would agree with that. Yeah. 
Well, one other last note before we wrap up here is, is, is we're in our television studio here at Bristol Community College, and we're more green as well. Uh, earlier yeah. this, uh, this uh, winter, we had our new television lighting installed, which uh, saved the college over $30,000, I believe, in, in its rebates, energy bill, in right. rebates. So yeah. we're glad to do our part. Yes, yeah, no, we are too. <laughs> well, Steve, Kenny, I appreciate your time. My pleasure. And, Thank uh, you for having you know, me. We'll, we'll be updating the viewers on the sustainability efforts of the college as we go forward. I appreciate so. it. I, I think making that public and, and making everyone aware of what we're doing, I think, is part of the mission of the college, is to be out there in the community and showing what others, we hope others will do in the future. Well, thank you again, I appreciate it. Thank you, Keith. We'll have more of Around BCC right after this. Welcome back. That was a look at the annual student juried art and design exhibit held at the Grimshaw Goodowitz Art Gallery this past month. The month of May is filled with events celebrating student success. It all culminates on June 1st at BCC's commencement. The exercises will begin at 11 a.m. at the Fall River campus. Commencement will air live on Fall River Community Television Channel 95 in Fall River or you can view it online streamed via frmedia.org. Among the highlights at commencement is recognition of those students who have excelled as part of the college's Commonwealth Honors Program. The Commonwealth Honors Program allows for students who excel in the classroom to take part in challenging educational experiences. There are 167 BCC students in the program this spring, most of whom were invited to the program through faculty recommendation. Program coordinator Tom Grady says students are rewarded for participating, especially when it comes to furthering their education. A lot of enhanced learning with faculty that has dividends both in the classroom and that they're meeting outside with this faculty person in a mentor-mentee relationship, and so it really helps groom them for a scholarship at a higher level. But also, you know, if they're looking for a recommendation or a reference, they're going to be able to, the faculty is going to be able to speak of them in a much more detailed way that will enhance their ability to, one of the other benefits, transfer to a competitive or selective college or program. Program, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as well as uh, the program allowing students to get a significant scholarship, a cash scholarship that is not offered at any other community college in the state. Student Craig Velozo got interested in the honors program as a way to challenge himself in and out of the classroom. What excites me is I'm the type of person to just, if I want to learn something, I'll go out and learn it on my own. But the Honors Program provides us with faculty advisors who can guide us in the right direction, give us some support, and earn college credit while doing study that would be otherwise independent because it goes above and beyond the normal curriculum. Returning students who feel they qualify as a Commonwealth Honors Scholar can apply for the program coming up again this fall. One of those honors courses students can take is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year and focuses on a dark period of world history. Remembering the Holocaust in literature and history is marking its 10th anniversary as an interdisciplinary honors program seminar. Co-founders Dr. Howard Tinberg and Dr. Ron Weisberger started the course as a way to teach the history and writings of the Holocaust 
in a community college setting. They say that over the course of time, the seminar has evolved through the use of multimedia. The show uh, has, has continues to live, as it were. Show studies continue to live uh, on the web, and, and there's so many testimonies of survivors that can be accessed at various websites. So we hope to use that even more. And maybe uh, I know we've talked over the years of, of bringing in the graphic arts into our discussion. So in, in addition to literature and rhetoric and, and history, yeah. you can see how the, how the painters respond to the show. I mean, that, that was one of the changes. They were talking about change. In the beginning, we had students do a research paper. And then um, about four years ago, we went to a, a, uh, a more electronic way of displaying uh, the research that they do. They still have to do research, but it's displayed in a kind of electronic poster. And that seems to have, it's challenging, but it seems to have worked out very well. Doctors Tinberg and Weisberger say they're impressed that the course continues to garner interest from inside and outside the college community. The second season of BCC's co-ed tennis team is in the books with the team growing and improving. In its second year of existence, the BCC co-ed tennis team has seen an increase in interest. First year head coach Phil Pietrangelo says the program is still in its infancy, but yielding results. Well, there is a, a certain level of um, growing pains that we're, we're experiencing just with numbers right now. And I really want to get to the point where um, just the presence of the team on campus is enough to bring people to the courts, asking questions about the team and getting involved with the team when they can. Um, so that's, that's where I'm at right now as far as um, interest with the team. As far as individual growth and development, all these guys already have shown a lot of growth and development. We have a couple players that are brand new to the team and they've shown you know huge strides and there's other players that have also been playing uh, all through high school and they might have played last year on the team and they're still improving especially in certain aspects of their game. For instance we have one player that's really improved his net play, another player that's really developed his serve over the last couple weeks and there's a few players that didn't even know how to keep score at the beginning of the season and played four matches this past weekend and did a really good job. So there's a lot of individual individual growth and a, little, um, a lot of individual goals that we have. We wish Coach Pietrangelo and the tennis team all the best as it continues to grow. Time for another profile of one of BCC's outstanding faculty. This month we talked to a woman who not only teaches psychology, but also motivates students to give back to the community. Hello, I'm Dr. Mary Zahm, Professor of Psychology and Director of Civic Engagement at Bristol Community College. I grew up in Rhode Island in the Massachusetts area and I grew up at a time when girls were encouraged to either be English teachers or nurses and to get married and have children and I couldn't afford to go to college to be an English teacher or a nurse so I became a practical nurse and I worked at that for a couple of years in pediatric nursing until I got married and I was a stay-at-home mom for 12 years. Then my children didn't seem to need me full-time anymore because they were going to middle school and I began to wonder what my life would be like if I had gone to college. So I told a friend of mine, I wish I could go to college and she said you can come with me and she took me to Roger Williams University, it was college then, and I walked in and they gave me a year's credit for my nursing and they convinced me to take the CLEP exams. So I started the first day as a junior at college. In order to take advantage of the nursing, I was in the Health and Human Services program. But I fell in love with psychology and I kept taking more and more psychology electives. And so I ended up with two degrees, a Bachelor of Science in Health and Human Services and a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology. So now I was able to go on to Rhode Island College for my Master's in Personality and Social Psychology because I had a degree in Psychology. From there, I went on to the University of Rhode Island where I achieved a doctoral degree in experimental psychology. I was offered an internship at Raytheon Company the summer before I graduated. And I worked there in operations research for the summer and soon after they offered me a full-time position. 
So I took the position. I was there for over 12 years. I was doing systems analysis, operations research. I was designing displays for combat systems and mine hunters and uh, training uh, equipment. After the Cold War and the Berlin Wall fell, defense industry was a little shaky. My husband and I were both working at Raytheon. So I decided maybe I would pursue my love for teaching, which I had been teaching part time as I was going working at Raytheon anyway. So I answered my first ad was Bristol Community College. I came here for an interview and I fell in love with it and I've been here since 1994. I love teaching here and it's just a wonderful opportunity because I have a lot of friends at the universities that are still teaching general psychology or whatever, child development, over and over and over. But here we're allowed to be very creative and to invent classes that meet needs for the students that we recognize. Um, I was on the committee that worked for student success, for example, which is now a mandatory class. Um, I teach a class uh, that I co-authored a book with uh, Joan Rollins from Rhode Island College, my former mentor, um, 110 Strategies for College and Success, which I use in the Learning Motivation Achievement class. And I teach honors classes. I teach the uh, Community Leadership class, and I teach the Empowering Women class. And so I have an opportunity to meet fabulous students, a lot of people like myself returning to school after being full-time homemakers. When President Sprague came here, here, he mentioned, uh, we don't have a civic gate, we don't have a service learning program here, we better start one. So does anybody want to do it? And I'm going, I don't know what it is and I don't want to do it. And Catherine Adamowitz said, I know what it is, I did that at Wellesley. And so she, oh Wheaton, I'm not sure which. And so she started out the program, defining some of the goals, going to meetings and figuring it out. So when she moved on and resigned, I got a phone call and was convinced, well, since you do it, maybe you'd like to do the program for six months. So I said, well, I'll do it for one year. And then I fell in love with it, and I've been building the program ever since. First, it was just service learning. Then I added community service because we had so many people getting awards for service learning. And we had many, many students who did many more hours in community service who weren't getting awards. So I brought that in, and then I developed a leadership program um, so that students Students who lead five peers on a project are recognized at graduation. They wear a red cord and so forth. And we've had quite a few students do that. Now looking back over my life, I realized I'd always done civic engagement type activities as a Girl Scout, as a girl growing up in a Catholic school, as a mom at home, the parent-teacher organization and the leadership and the League of Women Voters. And I never felt like I really had done much at all. When I went to college, people had told me, you could develop leadership skills, and these are things that are important for you to build on, and it made me have a sense of pride and self-esteem. So one reason I think it's important is just to make people realize, I'm already doing this. A lot of the women and men in our community are doing coaching, they're doing PTO, and I think it's important for them to realize that they are really contributing to their community. The other reason is to help people learn to contribute who are not already doing so. And so in the leadership classes, and the honors seminar in community leadership, and in the global leadership class, they learn these leadership skills and then they have an opportunity to practice them. And when you look at the world, and the world of employment around here, people are looking for uh, people who have leadership skills. Not only do they have to have knowledge, but they have to know how to apply it and how to lead teams and to lead projects. So I think it's very, very important. That's all for Around BCC. This is the final episode of the show for this academic year. We'll be back with a brand new season when classes resume in September. But we leave you today with a look at the diversity of cultures at BCC during the International Fair held at the Fall River campus last month. I'm Keith Tebow. Have a great summer. Thanks for watching.